just before 8.30, I got a phone call and it was Dave. And he said that he just wanted to go and get some coffee and he asked me if I wanted to meet him. And um, I, I said that I was just about to go into, the me into a meeting and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it. And I said, I love you and talk to you later. And that was the last time I, I ever spoke to him. Episode two, R.O.P.D. Classified. So before I start, I just want to thank everybody. I got a lot of good feedback from episode one. Episode one, we did it on the uh, Jonestown conspiracy or just the Jonestown story with uh, Jim Jones and his uh, coat and all that shit. Uh, I put a lot of people on game. A lot of people didn't know about his story. So I'm glad I was able to use my platform to shed a light, shed some light on that crazy motherfucker. So on episode two, I'm about to shed my light on uh, another crazy individual. Now, I'll leave it up to you to determine if she is as crazy as Jim Jones. I don't think it's a competition, really. I just think both of these motherfuckers crazy, but at least she didn't kill anybody. So I'm going to get into that in a second. Uh, to the listeners, if anybody got any suggestions for future episodes of R.E.O.P., Declassified, just hit me up. Mail at ariopodcast.com. That's mail at ariopodcast.com. And if you are in any of the comment sections, just go down below and just uh, tell me who you want for the next episode. I got an idea of who I want to do for the next two or three episodes, but I always want to hear you guys' suggestions. So any feedback you got for me, just let me know. I'm not an asshole, uh, I don't have an ego. Anything, any suggestion you got, just let me know. So, but let's get into it. So this episode, episode two of R.O.P. Declassified, will be on a young lady by the name of Tanya Head. And this has something to do with the World Trade Center disasters or, well, the 9-11 disasters, because not just the World Trade Center was affected on that day of 9-11. So... So we all familiar as Americans, we're all familiar with 9-11. 9-11 was one of the biggest disasters ever in American history. At around 8.46 a.m. on September, the future of the United States changed forever. Around 3,000 people were killed and 6,000 people were injured just in the World Trade Center attacks alone on 9-11. My memories on that day, I just remember being, I was in the seventh grade. I just remember being in uh, Miss Arterberry's. That's her name, Miss Arterberry's. I was in her English class. And she just casually talked about it. She had got a text from like her husband or some shit. And she was like, I think they just had a, a accident in New York. So when it was first brought to my attention in class, I I was like I said I was in the seventh grade, so September eleventh to September eleventh, two thousand one. I was twelve years old, so yeah, I was twelve years old. I was in the seventh grade, and we was just in class. I want to say it was the second period of class, and my teacher she got a text from her husband, like I just said, and she, the way she brought it to our attention was. Somebody was flying a commercial airline plane and they fucked up and they clipped one of the buildings. So she turned on the news. We were in the middle of a test. She stopped the test and said, fuck this test. This is crazy. This is a mon monumental situation in American history. So we got to see this. We'll do that test later on. So she stopped us from doing our test and she turned on CNN and we was watching the news and we was watching it live and they were doing coverage of what was going on so it was brought to our attention that it was an accident and then next thing you know we see live on the news we see a plane a, a second plane hit the other building and at that time we knew that america was under attack 
This, Justin, you are looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. The CNN Center right now is just beginning to work on this story, obviously calling our sources and trying to figure out exactly what happened, but clearly something relatively devastating happening this morning there on the south end of the island of Manhattan. That is, once again, a picture of one of the towers of the World Trade Center. So I live in Jacksonville, Florida, so 9-11 firsthand didn't impact me that much. I knew my aunt, she worked out there, and we was kind of scared for her, but we found out that she was okay around that day, around like 8 p.m. We found out she was okay, but as far as me, that's as far as 9-11 impacts me personally in my family in my like family situation but of course it changed the future of america forever but let's get into the story one of the survivors was tanya head she was a global investor for merrill lynch and she worked on the south tower on the 78th floor of the world trade center so her being on the 78th floor that means she was over the impact of one of the planes that hit the World Trade Center. So that means she was over the fire and the, and the debris. With her being on the 78th floor, that means she was one of 19 people that were able to survive being over the impact zone of the plane. At the time she was in the World Trade Center, she told everybody that she was saved by a firefighter. Now keep that in mind. She said on 9-11, on the 78th floor, she was saved by a firefighter. Remember that. Tanya also says her husband, Dave, died in the North Tower. Now, remember Dave also. So somebody being in such a devastating event and also losing the love of their life, you would think that would just scar them for the rest of their life. You would just think that would just uh, fuck them up and not many people would be able to live that down. So a couple years after this, she was still hurting about the Dave and the 9-11 terror attack. Tanya joined the World Trade Center Survivor Network. This was a healing group where survivors from 9-11 would bond together and uplift each other. At this point, it had been a couple of years and people were still scarred. So this was around 2004, I believe. So this was three years after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. The Survivors Network quickly embraced her and made her kind of the leader of the group. The people in the network loved her story and she fought for them. She fought for them so much she got them access to Ground Zero. So that was something the Survivors Network couldn't get. They couldn't get any access to Ground Zero. So she was able to take them down there and do like tours and shit she even did tours for mayor giuliani and whatnot so she just took she just joined to the survivors network and she just like she put that shit on her back pretty much she uh she fought hard for them and she would even ridicule some of the survivor network members for not working as hard as she did she eventually became like a rock star for the Survivor Network. She was given full tours with the mayor of the wreckage of the World Trade Center and doing full interviews with New York Times and other major publications. So the publications pretty much thought they were just like throwing her a bone. She was in such a tragic event. It wouldn't hurt them to make her some sort of a celebrity as quote unquote, as weird as it may seem, the face of 9-11, the face of 9-11 survivors. They wanted Tanya to be that because she was so outgoing and her story was, her story, her survivor story was way more animated and had, had a lot more details than the people that were actually survivors of 9-11. Matter of fact, when I was watching her documentary, it was a guy named Gary. He was one of the 19 people that survived on the 78th floor, which was the floor that Tanya was on. He was, a, well, I don't think he was on the 78th floor. He was around that. I know he survived from over the impact zone of 9-11. And 
his story wasn't his story wasn't as animated as her. His story wasn't as cool as her. He just basically says he heard the impact from the from the plane, and he just started walking downstairs, and he just he noticed the floors was on fire, and he just avoided them. He just walked all the way down eighty flights of stairs and got out the nine got out the building. So his shit wasn't his shit wasn't as cool as hers. She had a long drawn out story. I'll get to that in a second. But um, like I said, she was like a rock star. New York Times kind of wanted to make her like the face of the 9-11 survivors, which is weird as fuck, whatever. Eventually, with her newfound stardom, she became the president of the Survivors Network. They elected her the president. Some of the other members, they kind of was looking around like, I didn't know we were kind of electing positions and shit like that for this. We just kind of wanted to start a group where survivors of 9-11 could share our stories where we could embrace each other and make each other feel better because we was in this traumatic event and it's like fucking us up mentally. So we just wanted a group where we can share shit. I didn't know we were doing offices and different treasurers and shit like that. I didn't know this was going to become this. So with her newfound stardom, people started to notice her lies more. People started to notice her, what she was saying wasn't really connecting with the events and what she told them originally when she joined the Survivors Network. Whenever she talked about Dave, she never showed any pictures or anything. We never met Dave's family. So the thought crossed my mind, what if she's one of these people who just never tells the truth and she just made everything up? You know, the, the thought crossed my mind, but I, I didn't think it was possible. So what I did was I was about to go to bed that night and I figured, you know what? Let me just walk online, do a little research on part of her story, make sure there's a connection and see the story's true, go to bed. And he existed. Uh, he was where she said he was, and, you know, he died on that day. There were a lot of newspaper articles, message boards. He's a very popular guy. But there was one thing that wasn't there. Any mention of Tanya, anywhere. She was telling stories about, like, when the plane hit, she seen one of her co-workers, which was a male uh Give her her uh, give her his wedding ring and told her, "Hey, I'm dying. Get his wedding ring to my wife and tell her I love her." She told one story about seeing one of her coworkers get decapitated by the wing of the plane, which would be impossible because if you seen with your own eyes a big ass commercial airline decapitate your coworker with the wing of his plane. Yo ass would've got killed too, so her stories just wasn't add up. Her shit was like on some Bruce Willis shit, like like on some diehard shit. It wasn't making any sense at all, and people were starting to get hip to her stories. Also, you remember when I told you earlier, Tanya was saved by a firefighter, and I was telling you guys, remember the firefighter. So it was one of the survivors, his name was Gary. He was in around the same area that Tanya said she was at in the World Trade Center. So he was one of the 19 survivors. So he went up to her and he said, you told us you were saved by a firefighter. There wasn't any firefighters up there, and it, well, any people up there in firefighter suits. The person that saved me was a guy in a red bandana. She switched her story up to say she was saved by a guy in a red bandana. When she first told me that she was on the 78th floor, one of the first things she said was, did you see the man with the red bandana? And the answer was yes. She saw him. But over time that became, not only did she see him, but he put the fire out on her back. And I, I, think, I think possibly that he led her to the stairwell or something. So it seemed to change over time. That's what I noticed. The guy with the red bandana, his name was Wells Crother. Wells Crother died on September 11th. So Well Crother's mom contacted Tanya because she wanted to have a sit down talk with Tanya to find out what happened on that day so she could find out her son's last moments. But Tanya did not want to meet up 
one-on-one with Wells' mother. But Tanya did go to Wells' memorial service that his mom threw for him, which was kind of weird because it was years later they eventually had a memorial funeral for him, but she wanted Tanya to speak, but Tanya was so, like, she was so distraught she had a lady named Linda read her speech at Wells' memorial service, which should have been a red flag. So this lady, she has lies on lies, caps on cap on cap, and people were starting to get hip to it, but nobody was really applying pressure to the situation because who the fuck would lie about something like this? I had many conversations with Tanya, just one-on-one conversations, where she gave me a lot of support, like nobody else had. I admired her from the very beginning, how strong she seemed. And at the same time, once I started to get to know her, then I realized this whole strength thing that she shows is really a facade. She's really in pain. She she was she seemed to be really in pain, um, and really really distraught. And and I and I said, well, of course. How could she not be? She wouldn't even give people full info about her husband, Dave, which. When she first joined the Survivor Network, she was telling people that it was her fiance. And then I watched the documentary when it was um, her little clips of her interview. She was saying that she married Dave on the beach of Hawaii. And then she was telling people that she wasn't married yet. And then she was telling some people that some lawyers finagled some shit. And like she was able to get like a marriage license like at their death or whatever so she could be a widow all kind of shit like she wasn't even a good liar to me because she couldn't even remember any of her lies like simple simple lies she couldn't even remember that's why i stopped lying out here man uh let me know if y'all still lie i can't i stopped lying i don't think i was ever a bad liar but i don't get anything out of lying because when you lie you gotta remember everything you said any inconsistency motherfuckers remember that and they just be on you so i don't get why people lie it's just like no point in lying this is like a little white lie that that you just get quickly get away from but people just lying just a lie i don't get it because you just gotta remember everything you fucking said but back to this line motherfucker so she couldn't even remember all her lies my only gripe with this whole situation i felt like they should have been able to nip this in the bud quickly because only 19 people survived from that area of the World Trade Center. I feel like they could have been able to figure out who those 19 people were way quicker. Gary was one, which was in the, he was in the documentary. He was one of the members of the Survivor Network. If Gary's one, that means there's just 18 more left. You couldn't figure out what the 18 other other people were. And then she said she worked in Merrill Lynch. There was not a Merrill Lynch in the World Trade Center on 9-11. So I'm not understanding how, how she was able to get away with this shit for so long. And also, Gary, if he worked in the World Trade Center, I'm not sure how the World Trade Center was set up as far as businesses. Shouldn't him going to work every day? Shouldn't he been able to be like, uh, I don't remember a Merrill Lynch in the World Trade Center, so I don't know how the setup was. So maybe he was be able, maybe he was oblivious to what other companies were in the World Trade Center at the time. So let's get back to it. One thing that people in the Survivor Network were mentioning that made them think Tanya was telling the truth. She had a lot of severe burns on her right arm, and they believed that those those burns were caused from the 9-11 terrorist attack. So that was one of the things that Tanya had on her side because she had a lot of bad burns that she said she got on the day of 9-11. So people was like, these burns came from something in her life. So that's one of the things that was able to help her. Um, but also, people was also feeling like Tanya was overcompensating with her lies. Like I said earlier, uh, Gary, he said he just 
the man in the red bandana, Wells, he just came up and saved him, and they just he was able to just go down the stairs. And Tanya was saying she seen people decapitated, she seen people burning, she seen uh, the firefighter carried her down uh, seventy eight flights of stairs and whatnot. Her her story was like on some Spike Lee shit. It was it was on some Michael Bay shit. It was it was clearly directed. Like she could have been a a director in her time. So that's another thing. They felt like she was overdoing it with her story. She tape recorded her experience from September 11th. I heard the engines. I saw people pray. You knew you were going to die. And I was just praying. Please don't let this hurt. Please don't let this hurt. I would be behind her and she would start circling around and the tape would play. Oh my God. Oh my God. The plane is coming. The plane is coming. And it would literally crash and I can tell you I could visualize this stuff listening to her talk about it she would recount how her assistant was decapitated how everyone around her was was burnt she told me that her arm was completely severed that there was just one little piece of skin right here that where it was hanging off and some man started tugging on her arm and she was screaming and crying because she was afraid that this man was gonna pull her arm off. And she told me that she took her arm and she tucked it into her coat to keep it from falling off her body. And she'd start crying harder and harder and she would just, she'd be a wreck and I would be trying to hold her up. Like I didn't know what to do, I didn't know what to do. Right now, even talking about this, I get so worked up that I, Sorry, going into so much anxiety over this, but I did this for her because she was going to get better. Eventually, after years and years of what was going on after she was doing tours, the media started applying pressure on her. One of the main people in the media applying pressure on her was New York Times. So they basically um, they basically uh, told her they was doing a story on her. They was doing a story on Tanya and how she survived 9-11 and she didn't want to do the story at first because she felt like the jig was up she knew that it was time for her to get exposed so she was telling other people in the survivor network that the new york times was harassing her they told her that she was being stalked by people in the new york times and her story started unraveling more and more that the new york times was applying pressure on her then eventually, the New York Times did drop their article. So I couldn't find, on my re when I was doing the research, I couldn't find um, that exact New York Times article. I did find this one from the New um, Daily News. It was called Sky, Sky of Lies. Heartbreaking tale, food, and entire nation. And it's about Tanya. Really good article. Just Google that. Google image. Don't buy it because that shit costs $400. I was gonna um I was gonna cop the article and just like read excerpt excerpts from it. Four hundred dollars. But you know, I'm a, uh, I had to nig it up so I was able to get a uh, a little screenshot of it and I just zoomed in on that motherfucker. I know it got the big ass Getty Images logo on it, but fuck it. I ain't spending four hundred on no goddamn article. But yeah, I was able to read the article. Um, uh, it's pretty much nothing new. Um, nothing new from the documentary. So what what I used to do my research on this was a documentary called The Woman Who Wasn't There. So check that out. That's on YouTube. It's around, I think it's around like three bucks to rent. Just rent that motherfucker. This is really good. Um, it's not on Quan Flick. Shout out to Quan. I, ch I should have hit up Quan for that, for the, to get it for the free. But I paid it $3. That's how serious I am about my craft. So Y'all check that out. The Woman Who Wasn't There. It's a couple books on Audible. Use audibletrial.com slash REO podcast. Go ahead and get that. No, it's audibletrials.com slash random. That's what it is. Audible.com slash random. Use that. But yeah, they uh, New York Times, they dropped an article about her. They found out her real name was Alicia Estevez. And her husband, Dave, that died on 9-11 did not exist. There is no motherfucking name Dave. Now, of course, there are people named Dave that died in 9-11 because Dave is a popular name, obviously. They contacted everybody named Dave that was in both 
World Trade Centers on 9 11 families, and nobody knew of Tanya. They contacted them all. They, they was able to find out who all was in that building. Tanya was not in that building. There were Daves in that building, but it was no Daves linked to Tanya. So this lady name is Alicia Estevez, and not only on 9 11 was she not in the World Trade Center, her ass wasn't even in America. Alicia, she was in Barcelona, Spain. She's not even an American citizen. At the, t at the exact time 9-11 happened, she was in class. She was in her college class. And there is footage of her at her graduation a, a little bit after 9-11 happened. So she was able to take courses around 9-11 time and graduate in 2002. Let's go back a little bit. Nobody knows why she did this. And nobody can explain why she did it. It is nobody was able to contact her on why she did it because once this uh New York Times article came out exposing her, she immediately fled back to Spain. So nobody was able to press her, nobody was able to put the press ratio GoFundMe on her, nobody was able to scoop her up, nobody was able to do anything. Once that article came out, her ass was gone to Spain, living back with her mother, so Nobody knows the method to her madness on why she would see this uh, terrorist attack and come up with a whole lie, a new name, move to New York. Keep this in mind. She was living in Spain. She moved to New York to lie to people and make up her own life. She moved from Spain, another country, to New York to make up a lie. Make up Dave, make up all this shit, make up her being in a terrorist attack for fun. She did this for fun, my nigga. For fun. Ridiculous. This, this, this bitch gotta be the craziest motherfucker ever. After all this happened, they weren't able to put any criminal charges on her. I know people was listening to like, man, I hope this bitch ride in jail. They weren't able to put any criminal charges on her because... She wasn't receiving any money for this. She wasn't doing donations. She wasn't doing any kind of like drives or anything. She was she was just simply just doing tours. She wasn't getting paid for the tours. She didn't sign off on any um anything contractually. She was just there just lying. So you can't get arrested for just lying. If you got arrested for lying, it would be most motherfuckers would be in prison. So no criminal charges were ever brought on her. Matter of fact, most of the people besides Gary in the Survivor Network, they forgive her. They they feel bad for her. They think maybe something is like mentally wrong with her. Obviously, something is mentally wrong with her for her to lie about something like this. So they, they feel bad for her. They want everybody to forgive her. This lady's just crazy as fuck, man. So um, I had to bring some light to this story. I heard about this a while ago, and I kind of forgot about it, but I said I'll just do an episode on this, and as of right now, nobody knows where Tanya's at. When I was watching a documentary at, it's the documentary, I think this documentary came out around like 2011, at the end, they saw Tanya in New York, so it kind of, it was kind of spooky, so they just was walking and they just happened to see Tanya just walking down the streets of New York. So she, so apparently around 2011, she came back to New York. As far as me doing my research, the last thing I seen about Tanya was uh, around 2015. She did have a job in Barcelona, Spain, and she was fired from that job after they found out she lied about being a survivor on 9-11. So she... That was the last thing I was able to find out about her in 2015. So as of right now, nobody knows anything about her. Nobody knows if she's alive or anything. So, hey, I think that's it, man. That's uh, it's been another episode of uh, REOP Declassified, man. I hope y'all enjoy this one. The uh, next one is coming very soon. I will be doing that on the ah. Uh, Fuck. I'm going to do a vote on the on the Patreon. So 
I'm either going to do it on the 27 Club or the conspiracy about Paul McCartney dying in a car crash. So either one of those will uh, be the next episode. So to wrap this up, this has been another episode of Aria P Declassified. Y'all enjoy yourselves. I'm out. Tanya Head was just one of 19 people who had been above the point of impact in the, in the South Tower, lived to tell about it. After being badly burned, Tanya witnessed the decapitation of her assistant before coming across a dying man who begged her to deliver his wedding ring to his wife. Her own survival, she said, was made possible by the thoughts of beautiful...